Welcome to Data Driven Leadership, the education mini series. I am your host, Dr. Kirk, and I am joined by my colleague, Mike Bauer, uh, who is co hosting with me today. Uh, we have uh, with us Aaron Moat, the executive uh, officer at Innovate uh, EDU, a nonprofit that seeks to catalyze broad sector change in education. She's that and so much more across so many different fronts. Uh, I'm not even going to attempt to try to capture everything and instead let her tell you all of the great work she's up to. Uh, it's going to be a jam-packed episode today that I can't wait to dive into. So let's get to it. Erin, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so pleased to join you. Oh, Mike and I are thrilled. And uh, I invited Mike to the conversation. I, I know that the two of you have crossed paths professionally uh, for some time being in this space. And so uh, we look forward to having a, a great conversation. I hope one of many. Um, and Aaron, uh, before we get too far down the line, I would love for you to just summarize uh, for us uh, your work uh, today uh, in the education space. Uh, to give our audience an appreciation for uh, where you find yourself in your work. Great. Well, Innovate EDU is a house of brands, not a branded house. And that's because uh, in education, we uh, catalyze large-scale sector change through uncommon alliances. And so you probably know our brand um, if you don't know Innovate EDU. So whether it's a alliance that Mike was integral with uh, eight years ago in Project Unicorn, uh, which catalyzes movement and data interoperability uh, in K-12 education and really has grown a community of hundreds of vendors and close to a thousand districts who are all working to modernize their data ecosystems to the Pathways Alliance, which is focused on uh, quality educator pathways into the profession, particularly thinking through how do we create structures for scale of teacher apprenticeships, teacher residency programs that emphasize quality and diversity into the profession? Or that's the National Partnership for Student Success, which is the Biden-Harris administration's signature initiative around student success focused on adding 250,000 more caring adults to America's classrooms as part of pandemic recovery. And frankly, a large-scale strategy to ensure student success in our classrooms. Or the EdSafe AI Alliance, which uh, has over the last couple of years really driven policy cohesion and AI and education through the SAFE framework and leads a lot of work at the global, national, subnational, district, state level around AI policy in particular. And how do we think about safety, accountability, fairness, transparency, and the effective use of AI in education? And so the unifying factor there is we pull policy levers, technology levers, and capacity levers in order to bring people together to really drive at a common vision for what systems change looks like in education. I I love it uh, right there. I mean, uh, can we extend the podcast for three more hours? I don't know if, if uh, folks can listen that long, but um, absolutely fascinating. And, and Aaron, you didn't uh, start off in education. Is that right? Tell us a little bit about uh, your background and, and how that switch happened. Yeah, well, I, uh, I, I went to school like many of us, but uh, after uh, graduating college, uh, go blue uh, from the University of Michigan, I uh, went to work at Arizona State University. And then from there, I went into national security uh, for more than a decade, uh, working the vast majority of my time overseas, um, focused on innovation and broadband connectivity. And so had the ability to wire refugee camps like Darfur and Dadaab or watch a country um, be born in South Sudan um, or think about how we bring social infrastructure in places like Afghanistan um, during conflict. And so uh, part of that work, though, this is how I sort of got the bug, um, was thinking about using something really uh, esoteric called universal service funds. If you look on your cell phone bill, you'll see a little thing that says universal service funds. And we used that uh, mechanism in the global south to actually build uh, wide-scale mobile and broadband connectivity. And so when E-Rate got modernized, if you can go all the way in the way back machine to about 2010 um, in the Obama administration, 
I uh, helped think through what could be the model using cell phone taxes in order to drive e-rate modernization. And from there, I had just a a real wake up call that um, from my, you know, apartment in Washington, D.C., that I could get on the metro and go five stops and be at a school in Anacostia that was still on dial up and had far worse connections and access to the digital ecosystem and digital infrastructure than Juba, South Sudan. And so that really felt like my calling in uh, to education and a calling in to think about what are the things that I can do um, to really think through how we drive access, connectivity, and opportunity for young people in this country. That is that is amazing. And and for those of you who may not be familiar, the, the E-Rate program is the FCC's program that makes uh, telecommunications and information services more affordable for schools and for libraries and instrumental in, in getting our schools and our students connected. Uh, of course, with COVID, uh, it, it highlighted a gap we still have uh, and enforced yet more innovation and focus on accessibility and digital literacy and um, just such important work, so foundational. Um, and it, more work to continue, though. And um, appreciate your heart for the work. Uh, we shared a, a, a commonality in, in Savage and Qualities, a book which I read that, that turned me on to education and a book that's really foundational for you and your organization. Yeah, right? I mean, I think it's mandatory reading for anyone in education because I think it makes the argument that, um, you know, we have to think about education not just as a schooling system, but as a learning system. And that opportunity has to be uh, extended to all young people, regardless of the zip code that they live in, not just in East St. Louis, one of the uh, cities that Jonathan Kozel describes in Savage Inequalities, but also rural West Virginia. I think incumbent in our education system today is how do we use technology as a means to bridge opportunity, to accelerate access, and how do we think about technology as a means to open up opportunities for young people, not just in education, but in workforce and post-secondary connections. And so I believe in the possibility of data and education technology, while also making sure that we're clear about what the peril could be as well. So how do we balance that promise and peril? That's right. That's right. And and, and uh, teach students Absolutely. along the way as we're figuring yeah. it out, right? Uh, and and have them a part of that. Um, well, you know, as I said, I, I brought in Mike. He's our, our senior director for strategy and development at Result within our education practice. And and y'all's paths have crossed uh, in this work. Uh, and so, you know, Mike is, is new to Result and we're thrilled to have Mike on board, um, having come from AWS and prior to that been instrumental at the Dell Foundation and, and promoting interoperability through the EdFi Alliance as we know it now. Uh, Mike, do you, do you mind to just uh, give, give us a little story of like how y'all met and, and how, how, this, give, how this came to be? This is great. <laughs> this is great. I, I'm going to give my... I'm going to give my version of this story, and then Aaron will probably correct me and give me the actual version of this story. Yeah, yeah. So, circa, I was a relatively new program officer, you know, um, following uh, kind of the the directive of the data driven education portfolio at the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. This is circa 2014, and and you have to understand that a year prior, uh, Bill Gates himself stood up at South by Southwest EDU and proclaimed to the world that the future of education is here and it's called Enbloom. And everyone was going, what is, what is Enbloom? Woo, you know, and what it was is frankly, a, a, a technology, technological ecosystem that was in the cloud, which again, cloud in 2013 is fairly new, still questionable and unproven around security and lots of major contracts hadn't been formed yet with say the national security agency and the DOD and others. So early days for cloud, but yet here in Bloom comes as a, a interoperable uh, cloud ecosystem for vendors to, you know, be able to provide real-time assessment results, student information services, information enrollment management, and, and really new, next, next level uh, security. And frankly, we looked at the code and it was an incredible amount of, of, uh, uh, diligence. It was a, it was a behemoth in regards to the infrastructure security availability. But unfortunately, in the world of public opinion, it was brought down within twelve months, given the the, the lack of uh, appropriate. And there've been 
autopsy reports written about in bloom at this point. So if you can actually put yourself in where Aaron, who is forming a for-profit organization, a nonprofit organization, and a, a, a charter school network in Brooklyn, New York, she's doing all three of these things, you know, shortly after she just got married in the personal realm, right? And, and maybe sleeping, like maybe not, we don't know. <laughs> so, so she's depending on InBloom, like for her, her charter school network. And, and she's going, you know, InBloom looks like it's going downhill very quickly. And sure enough, a year to the day, they closed the doors on InBloom from when that announcement had been made by the Gates Foundation. And, and so Aaron immediately turned inward, my understanding, and looked, you know, well, what was the guts, being a technologist, as she just now said, what were the guts of InBloom? Like, what was the data stand? What was the data model that it was built on? And she found out very quickly that it was this new version of a data standard called EdFi. And so EdFi 1.0 was what she found. And she said, well, she, she said, I'm not, I'm not going to swear here, but she said some things like, we're going to build our own SIS and we're going to build our own <laughs> assessment platform and we're going to build our own learning management system, you know, for this charter school. And we're going to use the data standard that the Dell Foundation has just now put a lot of money around and bootstrap. So that led us to each other in South by Southwest EDU 2014. And we got an, an elevator in the Hilton and we started talking about the, the possibilities of, you know, using, you know, building a platform. Uh, that platform was later called Cortex uh, for Brooklyn Laboratory Charter School. And Aaron, I, I mean, that was the inception right. point of our relationship. And then it grew and grew and grew. And then we, we be, I mean, I, I don't want to take credit for an entire term being, you know, created, but the word interoperability in 2014 was a very scary, unexplored word. And it was like trying to say, like, we need to take that word alone and figure out how to get that into the procurement machine of demanding supply and demand for interoperable, secure, safe, you know, uh, data that goes from, you know, SISs to external applications. And, and without the, the nasty human API, we would call it, of CSV files and you know, broken architectures. Close. So, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. I'll stop. You, you guys are literally like you lived the history of, of this book, um, <laughs> assessing the educational data movement. You you all like led it. Um, that's so <laughs> awesome because it, it, for those who are uh, maybe not as familiar with the in bloom, it, it, it closed out in, in 2014. And instead of a large scale open source platform where there's multi-state collaboration, the trend since then in data-driven uh, technologies has been towards closed proprietary systems, piecemeal, layer upon layer, data is locked up, data is siloed. And it, I think it's so important that we dissect it and that we talk about it and that we lear learn from it and, and understand people process technology policy. How, did this, how, do, how do we get this right the next time? Aaron, you devote a lot of time and attention and, and talks about uh, you know, public infrastructure Yeah, I mean, I'll just say to count Mike's story off earlier this year uh, from the East Room of the White House, Joe Biden stood up and talked about the need for wide scale interoperability, cybersecurity in our K-12 ecosystem. And so uh, from a from a Hilton elevator to the East Room of the White House, uh, now interoperability is a word that people talk about and 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 recognize as something that they need to demand in their data systems. And I think part of that work is about helping people overcome the thing that, frankly, I think took InBloom down. It wasn't an architecture and it wasn't the technology and it wasn't the data standard. It's how we talk about the use of data, how we talk about our role as stewards of data, particularly stewards of minor data, and how we talk about the way we need to build infrastructure so that uh, the best practices in interoperability, cybersecurity, and privacy can come forward and so and be used. And I think we hadn't made those investments in education data at large compared to maybe some of the other sectors your listeners are familiar with, like healthcare data. Probably folks who might only know healthcare are like, what do you mean? You don't have educational record interoperability. We've had healthcare record interoperability. The federal government funds it. They've built the data standard. They're the largest 
proponent of it with Medicare and Medicaid. How do we not have that for our young people? But I think that's a really good question because I think about the young person whose parents are serving in the U.S. military right now and they're stationed in Georgia and they get the call that next year they're going to be stationed in South Carolina. Both of those states have pretty robust student longitudinal data systems that hold student data. But right now, talk about a silo. Those states can't share that data. And so even when we know that a young person is going to move every two years, we still are basing so much of our data infrastructure off a 1978 law called FERPA that thinks we're going to take a paper file and walk it across state lines or go to our next school. And as a parent of a child who um, is, a, you know, a student, but also has an IEP and a 504 plan, because those are two tools for students with disabilities that talk about my son's disabilities and, and how we support him and give him access. And frankly, technology has been magical to my son who has dysgraphia, which is a disability related to handwriting. And so his ability to do text to speech and to unlock his brilliance is something I talk about a lot as like the possibility of tech. The fact that if Robert were to change schools, just like that young person in Georgia whose dad or mom is in the military and is going to need to move schools to be in service to our country, literally, we can't move the data about our young people so that they're safe, known, and loved. And so that is missing in our system right now. So, so much of the work we do at Innovate EDU is ask the question, under what conditions would it be possible to build a data infrastructure that's a public utility in this country or a set of principles that are public utilities that could help us actually realize the possibility of technology and data in the service of education? I, um, I I don't know what else to say after that. I mean, perfectly said, perfectly said and articulated. And, and you're right, even if you are not in education and educator, we all have either experienced what you just described or know someone who's experienced that. Something so simple as switching schools and the fact that on day one, sometimes on day 30, we still have Going, no idea. Like six months in, about we that have student. no idea. Like six months in, we're still figuring out that, that young person needs this set of accommodations or is brilliant in math or was in a gifted and talented program or loves Legos. Like the fact that we we can't know our whole the whole child and it's 2024 is mind boggling. That's what I'm about to say. The juxtaposition of what we can do and, and how I get reminders on social media of where I was 10 years ago and pictures and data from like all of that and I can see this picture, this portrayed it's social media. And that's just the social aspect, right? And it's like, how much more important is the educational data? Like, it, why is that not as accessible, known, uh, you know, actionable? Like, it should be the exact level. I mean, it's so the juxtaposition of what we would say is the entertainment aspect of our lives versus like the academics. Like, how do we not have the exact same? Uh, availability, uh, real-time capabilities, and uh, to be able to see this historical progression of data, you know, for our children, like our, how, how much more important does it, you know? And, and we just talked about one dimension of using data. I mean, you know, as a, as a practitioner, um, as an educator, just as a physician, you need to understand the situation. You need x-rays, you need CT scans, you need lab tests, right. you need your own professional training and the art of the practice coming together to diagnose, treat, and care for the patient or in education context, the student. And institutions of education amass such large amounts of data um, and we're not using it to fuel real-time decisions and, and make informed decision-making. And unfortunately, uh, education and data have had a, a rocky relationship, I think I could say, to, to where you know data has been used as a gotcha, as a, as a tool to... Uh, drive compliance and and but we're seeing a pendulum swing, uh, and and we uh, result in are are dedicated to be a part of that that shift that mindset shift, but also in democratizing data and making it accessible. Um, it really just lights up potential and opportunity and and, and uncovers trends that 
um, a teacher may not been able to have seen before, given all of the responsibilities that they have. Yeah, right? Or it highlights yeah. something about that teacher that, like, let's just say the thing is biased. So I think about this. I'm going to say yes. the hard stuff yeah. here because that's what I do. Um, you know, we worked I with a district so, so. Uh, who did a data interoperability project that um, used a data interoperability set of tools to surface without teacher recommendation, those young people who would be eligible for AP classes, those young people who might be eligible for pro more intensive project-based learning classes, the type of classes that if you take an AP class in high school, your chance of getting into an elite school and being successful in college goes up by a factor of six. And so often access to those classes are, is driven by the relationship you have with the teacher or maybe the, the set of interactions that you have with an educator. And it's not necessarily always about the quality of your work or your ability to do that work. So what happens when we use data to hold up a mirror to our own bias and say, actually, it's not just these three kids that you have on a small post-it note on your desk who would be capable and eligible for this higher level of work. It's these 12 and expand the aperture of opportunity for our young people. And I think that if we are to turn this Titanic around a little bit to overcome this siloing in our system, it's going to take an uncommon alliance, industry, nonprofits, and the public sector to do this work together. And that's why so much of the policy that we advocate for is about understanding that you have to build on common alliances to drive large-scale sector change. So in AI, for example, right now, if you look at some of the data that came out last week from our partners at Stanford HAI, they'll tell you all the capacity in AI right now is an industry. It used to be that some PhD graduates went to government and some went back into research and some went into industry. They're all going into industry right now. And so if that's where the capacity and knowledge and expertise lies right now when it comes to AI and AI technologies, which are rival technologies, they're not Bitcoin and they're not, you know, Web3. This isn't a rival technology. This is the same thing like the Internet. Um, so we have to be ready in our school systems to understand how to equip our educators, our families, communities, and students with these tools. We're going to have to partner with industry here. We're going to have to leverage that capacity and expertise. We're going to need to do the same thing in data because we are so far behind as a sector. I hate to break it. No, and I love you speaking the truth here. And a lot of uh, your work uh, in and outside of Innovate EDU has been around setting this table uh, through the you know, the EdSafe um, AI Alliance through Project Unicorn. Uh, that was one of the first things Mike made us do, by the way, is sign up for Project Good job. Unicorn. Good job, Mike. Probably have the badge on our website now. <laughs> we have we have that badge on our website, so we follow his orders there. But uh, talk just a little bit about how those organizations work and how they are setting that table for that public and private partnership. Um, because I think that's really critical for for leaders in every industry to hear. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about EdSafe AI and, and the work that we've been doing at EdSafe AI. And in EdSafe AI, you know, that alliance was formed more than three years ago. So I will just say, like, it's also not just about generative AI, which I get is like the consumer breakthrough that all of us are having to sort of deal with. Word. But there's a lot of other types uh -huh. of AI um, in technology, synthesis AI or surveillance AI. And so... A group of us um, who work at the intersection of education and technology recognized a couple years ago this was coming and our sector was really ill prepared for it from a policy perspective, from a technology perspective, and frankly, from a practice perspective. And so we believe that you first have to build knowledge, not fear. And so how do you bring people together who can bring that expertise, that guidance, that, that knowledge and really do some of that fundamental knowledge building? How do you then think about coherence um, when you're talking about policy work? So, so much of EdSafe's uh, agenda, policy agenda, is focused on coherence, coherence in using the SAFE framework, coherence in starting with safety first, coherence in the global uh, policy sort of arena so that the U.S. is participating in other forums and also learning 
um, from other governments and institutions. I think it's a pretty significant thing to see someone like the African Union with all 55 member states voting in one block. That's never happened before. They have enormous power. So imagine what's going to happen with South to North development there, where that's when innovations developed in the global South come into the West or into the global North. And so I'm super excited and interested to look at how we can bring that coherence together. And then a big thing we're advocating for specifically around AI and education is public utilities. And that's the ability for folks, whether they're in the research community, in the district or state community, or in industry to have a set of utilities that's access to large-scale nationally representative data sets with privacy-protecting technologies or the ability to have national red teaming or the ability to have consortiums who can look at data integrity, look at whether or not an algorithm has bias in it, and to also educate our districts and states about um, how they can share their data responsibly to train these models so the models themselves are more representative and also we can eliminate bias. Because right now in education, so many of the tools that are being built can only train their models on their own data. And that is really problematic. And it, there is bias in that data, right? Yes. Humans were part. You know, yeah, we had. I wholeheartedly agree. And in, in we, we've begun to sketch out a data equity framework. We, we have to ask ourselves questions. We have to ask, where is this coming from? What's the source? What, how is the data? Because that that unintentional bias can be perpetuated and spread like wildfire if we're not careful. So sorry, I wanted to jump no, in there. No, totally. To say, yes. Exactly. I'd love to hear that. That's why industry has to be at the table, right? Because if we're going to drive safety, accountability, fairness, and transparency, and then ask if this is an effective use case for AI and education, we need industry asking those questions. We need policymakers to ask those questions, and we need practitioners to ask those questions. So we're trying to build a table that really brings together industry and major nonprofits in the education space, including both major national unions are sitting at that table, which is unprecedented, along with the civil rights community, the disability community, technology actors like COSIN and Digital Promise. And so what does it look like if we actually row together and using movement science, like a Jonathan Kosal or a Thomas Kuhn, um, how do we think about if we row together, what's the change that we affect? And I know it's possible because, again, like, look at data interoperability in our space. Like, who would have thought we would have created a movement called Project Unicorn around data interoperability? No one. So uh, I'm just going to come up with another mythical character for AI, and then that'll be the name of our new movement. <laughs> I love it. Well, well, we'll be sure to put links to both of those organizations, those movements uh, in the episode here. But just imagine for a second to use that, you know, chronic absenteeism is such a hot topic right now. What would it look like if we put that problem on that table where there are these groups together and we're rowing the same direction? We can make some major strides with chronic absenteeism or third grade literacy well, you know, whatever it might be, uh, it just it gives you goosebumps to think about the potential. But there's still there's still work to be done, right? Yeah, I mean, I think chronic absenteeism is actually a data problem. So uh, it's, it's a it's mm -hmm. a human problem and a change management problem. But it's also, you know, are we do we have data to ask ourselves questions like why is that child always late on a Thursday morning? And maybe the answer is they're walking their sibling to school. Or maybe the answer is like, you know, if they're in high school during the pandemic, I'm just going to say that this is happening. So nobody is surprised when I say this nationally on stages. They're working a job like they were doing remote school. They became a breadwinner in their family. And in some communities, you they they can't give up that income right now. And so how do we actually peel back the onion on chronic absenteeism, use data to ask meaningful questions and connect with our young people to deepen the human connection in our schools and between our schools and between learning. And frankly, the last thing I'll say is we need to do some work to make learning meaningful for young people. Right now, I think young people are telling us uh, they're not coming to school because school isn't meaningful for them. If that's not a giant wake up call, yeah, they're disengaged. Um, 
So we got to yeah. do something different. I uh, I used to lead alternative high schools. So you know this. Yeah, I agree. I, when I would lead alternative high schools, um, so many bright kids, they just became disengaged. And when you find ways to engage them, it, so much lights up. In our state, we have um, a, a disengagement issue, a problem, right? Where we have um, enough students to fill the football stadium every year of students who are disengaged youth. What are we doing? We have to rethink about delivery, engagement. We can use IT. We can use data technology to do that. We just have to be ready to do the hard things. And we can do hard things. We just need to put our hand to the plow and and move in the same direction. Yeah. And you there's some aspect of this is like common sense. I mean, Aaron, one of the stages you were speaking on just last week happened to be at the AI Revolution pre-conference in San Diego. And, you know, I heard you speak, I heard others speak, and it was like t- to watch, uh, one of the announcements was Mr. Beast is going to be partnering with East Carolina University on short form content, learning content. And I'm going, this is, this is exactly what we mean by meet the youth where they're at and meet them in the context and modality that they're used to consu- consuming content, because now they will be engaged. And like, that's just one of the newer, you know, modalities. What's next? What's in five years? What's in 10 years? And we can't just, now, if you're not familiar with Mr. Beast, like I, I was like, Mr. What? Who's Mr. B? <laughs> uh, big YouTuber, uh, known as Mr. Beast, right? Um, uh, personality. Uh, I just, I, I I'm, I'm nearing 40, yeah. I guess. And that, that showed, uh, no. that's, that's, but that's, super. And, and, and my kids are teenagers, Kurt. So it's like, that, that's what they watch nonstop. Oh my gosh. No, but that's, that's so cool. And so Aaron, you know, you, um, are a pioneer in this, in this space. You are a change maker an innovator. I don't think it was by accident that the first lady mentioned interoperability in the white house. I think you had something to do with that. Uh, Hard just might is my guess, but, um, summarize for us what, data-driven leadership means to you? How do you think about that uh, that phrase? Everyone can be a data-driven leader. I think if you're a student, can you look at your own data and say what's missing or what does what, what story doesn't this tell about me? If you're a parent, are you asking for data about your young person? Are you asking your school to deliver a more comprehensive picture of your of of your child so that you can actually engage with them uh, around what they know and, and what they don't and, and what's happening. If you're a school administrator or a district leader, um, frankly, like we have to modernize our data ecosystems. You have to make these investments and you can do it in a way that protects the safety and security of data. And you can meet your obligation of being a steward of this data And finally, I think as a sector, we need to understand what do we want to achieve in education? I think we need to evolve education to go from schooling to learning, actually being a system that's a learning system that looks at data and the hard questions about whether or not we're meeting young people where they are, whether or not we're meeting young people with opportunity. And so data-driven leadership is, are you willing to be curious? Are you willing to ask questions? Are you willing to say the hard things? If you could do that, you can be a data-driven leader, no matter what seat you sit in. I love it. We have to be listening. We have to be learning, uh, being curious, uh, all those things. Wonderful, wonderful points to leave on. Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, we will continue to follow yeah. your work closely. Uh, and as a as a IT and data consulting from the private sector space, uh, we are at that table. Uh, we want to build that table with you. And so thank you so much for for making the way possible. Um, and Mike, thanks for joining us today, too. Well, thanks for being a unicorn. We Absolutely. We appreciate the unicorns. We're proud. So <laughs> we, love, we love unicorns. All right. Excellent. Uh, thank you again for joining us on this episode of the Education Mini Series. I'm Dr. Kurt, your host. Be sure to follow Data Driven Leadership on your preferred podcast platform. And don't forget to rate and review, sharing how these discussions on education data are making a positive impact on your organization. Stay tuned for our next episode, where we will continue our exploration with more education experts and data leaders.